Thanks for joining us today as you listen to a portion of a message recorded at Vine Life Church in Boulder, Colorado. If you'd like to connect with us further, you can visit us online at www.vinelife.com. Thank you, beautiful Bob, beautiful people. (laughs) Isn't it wonderful that we can just continue to participate in a conversation that began before time was? We don't have to try and invent new words, new language. We just discover that we are the language. (laughs) That the language that God spoke would forever be most articulately known in human form. On the back of the uh, Mirror Bible, I have um, just referenced um, 2 Corinthians. So maybe I could just read the... Do you mind if I read the back page for you? (laughs) If you haven't got one yet, buy just for the back page. <laughs> um, I wrote you that the incarnation is the most accurate and articulate translation. Thank God for what we have in our hundreds of English translations <laughs> of original thought. I value every one of them. There is so much to be said and to be known and to be drawn from. But ultimately, the most accurate translation is not covered in calf leather, but in human skin. Any sincere student of classical music would sensitively seek to capture and interpret that piece so as not to distract from the original sound of the composition, to form an accurate conclusion in the study of our origin would involve a peering over the Creator's shoulder, as it were, in order to gaze through His eyes and marvel at His anticipation. His invisible image and likeness is about to be unveiled in human form. (laughs) I'm sure that was a moment when even deity held their breath. I think it was on a Facebook status last week where we just said that um, how the thought of you intrigues your maker with delight. We continue on the back page. The incarnation celebrates the fact that the destiny of the word was not the page but tangible human life. The word of truth accurately preserves God's original idea in the resonance of our hearts. Isn't it wonderful that there is a communication that finally makes sense for all eternity? You remember the initial days of technology leading us into a new language and a new understanding of I mean, we, I had no clue what people went when they, meant when they talked about Bluetooth. I kind of, Bluetooth? And, and then finally we realized, oh, it's just another bit of language and information, how we could invisibly transmit documents if we share compatibility in our device. And here we discover <laughs> that God, by far eclipses our best, most amazing technology yet to be invented in engaging us as his eternal audience. I'm so glad that God is not economic in his language. A little drip here, a little drab there. Do you also use drips and drabs in American English? Day to day pours forth knowledge. And God does not go silent at night. Night to night declares wisdom. There is no place on planet earth or in the universe for that matter where the original logic, the logos of God, does not vibe right with life because everything is upheld by the word of his eternal utterance 
And the theme of God's language has always been his image, his likeness, unveiled in human life. You are not a footnote somewhere in God's agenda. You are what the living God is all about. The whole book is all about Jesus, but thank God that all of Jesus is about God rescuing. Jesus means God's rescuing act. What was he about to rescue? Our minds from the lies that we believed about ourselves. He came to rescue and establish his image and his likeness in human life. So let me just read the rest of the back page before we carry on. Then in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2, Paul writes this. He says, he says this. He says, instead of an impressive certificate framed on my wall, I have you framed in my heart. You are our epistle written within us, an open letter speaking a global language. One that everyone can read and recognize as their mother tongue. Verse 3. The fact that you are a Christ epistle shines as bright as day. This is what our ministry is all about. The Spirit of God is the living ink. Every trace of the Spirit's influence on the heart is what gives permanence to this conversation. We are not talking law language here. This is more dynamic and permanent than letters chiseled in stone. This conversation is embroidered in your inner consciousness. It is the life of your design that grace echoes within you. Now remember how Peter, James and John were invited six days after Simon discovered there's more to me than my mother's womb giving me birth with the help of Jonah, my father. Until that moment, six days before Matthew 17, everyone knew Simon, the son of Jonah, as Simon, son of Jonah. And suddenly Simon, along with everyone else in that specific audience, is confronted with the ultimate question, who am I? Jesus words it like this. He says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Did you get that? Jesus did not ask, you know, who do men say that I, the Messiah, or I, the son of God? He said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? You see, when God came to speak the ultimate language of the eternal conversation, which our fathers and the prophets carried in fragments of thought, even the philosophers, you know, in their day proclaimed that in him we live and move and have our being. Um, this was 900 years before Christ, a Greek, Greek philosopher, Epimendes, and then 300 before Christ, Aratus came out with, we are indeed his offspring. You can go and Google that. These are old Greek philosophy songs. So mankind sought to define in their, in their most articulate vocabulary something that would resonate my origin, something that will connect with my being, where I come from, who am I? And when Simon by revelation declared him, son of man, you are son of God, you're the Messiah, you're what the scriptures are all about, you are the person that the promise pointed to. And I'm so glad that Jesus didn't merely pat him on the back and congratulated him, handed him a theological degree and a certificate. Well, absolute wonderful theology you've got here, Simon. But he declared in that moment, Simon, son of Jonah, allow me to introduce you to you. Now that you know who I am. The message of the gospel in its most profound conclusion is simply a messenger Introducing the next audience to the conclusion of what it was that our maker 
unveiled in Christ Jesus. Not as in a display window, but as in a mirror. No, Jesus did not come to compete in the religious market for a little presence, for a little place amongst all our theologies and philosophies as a next option. He did not come to compete with Buddha, Moses, Mohammed. Didn't even come with any kind of mission to establish a new grouping on planet Earth. But he did come to boldly unveil our original design, clothed in human form. He did not come to politely apologize for a faulty design. He came to declare us. And in declaring us, he came to speak the language of God, the resolve of God, the relentlessness of the love of God that would not be distracted by any dimension of mankind's fallenness, of mankind's darkness. The true light that enlightens every man was about to dawn. And he did. And he came to articulate himself through the lips of an uneducated, illiterate fisherman. By revelation, Simon declares, Jesus, you are it. You are the Christ. You are what the Messianic, what the thought carried for generations, pointing towards a person and a moment. This is it. And Jesus says, well, Simon, now that you know who I am, allow me to introduce you to you. Why would we need to be introduced to ourselves again? Because James, the brother of Jesus, not Simon's partner in the fishing industry. This is now James, the brother of Jesus. The one that Paul went to visit after Paul's encounter. Remember in Galatians chapter 1, he says for three years he immediately did not communicate with the established um, eyewitnesses in Jerusalem. Because he had such an eye opener that took him beyond knowing what his idea of the Messiah was. Studied under Gamaliel, the professor in Jerusalem. He says, I immediately did not consult flesh and blood. I did not want to be interfered with. You know, there was such a space of knowing that burst in my spirit that I did not want to filter this knowing through other ideas of people who knew him according to the flesh. And in that time, he went to Jerusalem three years later. To meet with two individuals. He calls the one Kephas. Interesting that you are Petros. Why? Because it's the Greek for rock. But the Greek was the written language. The academic language. The spoken language was Aramaic. So just in case we get too familiar with a sound in a name that we forget its meaning, Paul says, I also visit, I came, I, I went specifically to Jerusalem and spent two weeks with Kephas. Would you say Cephas in, Af in, in American English? Cephas, Kephas, same guy. What does Cephas mean? Rock. Peter, Pete. You know, we've got very, various sounding names that also just, just becomes in our language, in our dialect, same thing. Rock. Mr. Rock is the theme of this understanding. <laughs> because God's language is look to the rock from which you were hewn. The day that the temple was built. Remember Peter, the rock, writes about us being living stones built into the spiritual stature, this tabernacle that is not made by human hands. And he takes it from 1 Kings 6, 7, where we read that the day that the temple was built, it was built with stone cut to perfection in the quarry. There was not even a sound of a hammer or a chisel or any instrument of iron. Why? Because it was not necessary. What happened in the quarry was enough. The quarry can only reference the cross. Now it's not your marriage, your job, your school that you have to study. Stuff that happens to you that God will just use to hammer and chisel you away so to prepare you for heaven one day. This is referencing the cross where in that moment God would perfectly finish the work that was finished from the beginning to introduce us to the Sabbath of God where we cease from our own labors. Now to get back to Peter. So Peter was this illiterate brother. Paul went to visit him. And, Pete, and Paul also visited James, 
the Lord's brother. This is, I'm sure it's Galatians 1, I think, verse 19. So Paul went all the way from where he was in hiding under the radar for three years, and now he visits with two most prominent leaders, Peter and James. Both of them finally caught the revelation with the same intensity and the same impact that Paul did because of his relation with him. It was strained at times, but I thank God that even Peter, when he finally begins to write, he becomes literate, and he begins his opening statement in 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Oh, it's so beautiful if you get it into the mirror. We'll put it into the mirror soon. But he speaks there about that we were born anew. Peter saying, can you imagine Peter saying that? We were born anew when he was raised from the dead. I mean, from the moment Peter heard rock, you know, his whole theology became filtered through rock language. Uh, Deuteronomy 32 says, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect. (laughs) How do we measure his greatness then? By the perfection of his work, by what his Sabbath celebrates. It's the artist of the universe. Finally signing his name, putting his his brush down, says that's it. So when the stone was rolled away, or when Isaiah said, you seek God, you pursue righteousness. Isaiah 51 verse 1. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, the quarry from which you were dug. And so Paul visits Cephas, Kephas, Petros, Mr. Rock, and also James the Lord's brother. Now what I was going to say is that James, the Lord's brother, did not believe in Jesus during the three years of Jesus' ministry. John 7 verse 5 says none of his brothers believed in him. But Paul gives us a beautiful reference to a moment where everything in James' being exploded with revelation. Imagine being a physical brother to Jesus. Even his mother had her doubts, remember? They were standing outside when they were supposed to be inside, giving notes to him. You're neglecting your family, you know. Jesus, your mother and brothers are waiting outside. Jesus didn't go, oh, I'm sorry, I've gone over my time. I'm really neglecting my family. He came for a bigger family. Because there's only one father. Paul says, I bow my knees before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Mankind only has one legitimate father. The father of lies in any of our doctrinal definitions would never ever for all eternity compete with the father of truth. He brought us forth by the word of truth. Now James says it is possible for us to hear the word and encounter the resonance. Encounter the understanding that as he is, so are we. Encounter the understanding that every good and perfect gift comes unuthen from above. The same word Jesus uses in conversation with Nicodemus. Jesus did not say to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He said, unless a man, mankind, a person, Anuthin, he's born from above. He would have no appetite for, for heavenly things. It's not our mother's womb that defines us. So James understands. Okay, before we get to James 1, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives us a reference how Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to several individuals, including at one moment, more than 500 people, and at the time of writing, Paul says most of those people are still alive. And then he also appeared to James. And when James saw the appearing of the resurrection, what did Peter say about the resurrection? We were born anew when Jesus was raised from the dead. Something happened in our perception. Something happened in knowing ourselves from now on, no longer according to the flesh. We have discovered ourselves brought forth by the word of truth. Our true genesis is unveiled. 
in Jesus. He has come to introduce us to ourselves again. And so in this context, you know, we have Peter, we have James giving testimony to the life of our design on display. And so when Peter um, writes his final little um, contribution, I have not completed the whole of Second Peter because I'm not sure whether it was actually Peter who wrote the whole of Second Peter or First Peter for that matter. But we will continue with that in our translation. It's an ongoing book and we will make our reference and, and notes as we continue to study. But there is a most significant chapter called Second Peter chapter 1 that we've completed in the Mirror Bible. All I want to do is I want to bring your attention to Peter's testimony here. Hmm. He says in verse 13, yeah, I might as well just read verse 12. Having said all this, and that is a whole message on its own, I think I touched on it last year when we preached about this, the choir conductor. Um, verse 12, now Peter says, having said all this, I'm sure that you can appreciate why I feel so urgent in my commitment to you to repeatedly bring these things to your attention. As indeed you have already taken your stand for the truth as it is now revealed in the gospel. In the first book he says that the, the, um, the prophets who prophesied about this grace that was to be yours searched and inquired. They knew that they carried a message which was most relevant for generations to come. They knew that whatever God spoke in the theme of the scriptures of the Old Testament always pointed to two things. A day and a person. And on that day, in that person, God would judge mankind in a sense. The whole of mankind would be equally declared innocent. Because the one thing that veils the likeness and image of God from us is our darkened understanding. Blindfold mode that we've inherited from the futile ways of our fathers. So Peter is most urgent about this. So he says, I will repeat this again and again. Now notice what he says. His language changes somewhat. He says, so verse 13. So while I am still in this body suit, I take my lead from the revelation of righteousness. Now this morning I hope we get a time to just key in on the revelation of righteousness. So Peter says, I take my lead from the revelation of righteousness and make it my business to thoroughly stir you until these truths become permanently molded in your memory. <laughs> In verse 8, he speaks about repeat, rehearsing these things, all these things, you know, everything that it takes, verse 3 of Second Peter 1, everything that it takes to live life to the full, God has gifted us with, not as a reward for diligence, but as an unveiling of where we began. And then Peter speaks of this word in the Greek, to rehearse. And I often think of our younger son, Stefan, who is a classical pianist. He's been in Europe for six years already, now he's 25. And once a year he sits in my study where he goes through a piece that he memorizes. It's a new piece. And he would go through those maybe 80 pages and rehearse them, play them, go through every run again and again and again. So that what is heard on that page, what was heard by the composer, can now be made flesh again, repeated again in the next moment where this sound finds its final art articulate translation in human form and when he plays when in concert or wherever the, 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 the page is no longer there there is just this reference that draws from within giving exact articulate expression to the original sound this is God's doing and so Peter says I will continue to make, make sure that by repetition we are molded in our memory in the same stature, the stature of the invisible God visible made visible in us hallelujah I'm so glad that the more we encounter his visible nearness in us we don't go more like spooky as it were 
together. We just kind of live in this seamless dimension of our oneness, living from there, living in the awareness of our oneness, which becomes our worship. You can wake up with that same mode in the middle of the night. And later on this morning, we will speak about in the middle of the most severe crisis, in the middle of the most severe contradiction, your true north reference unveiled in Christ remains the same because Jesus is the same yesterday. And you can take yesterday into the eternal past before time was. And his sameness was never compromised. Otherwise, God would have had to quit his rest. But God's Sabbath is celebrated for all eternity and invites, invites us into the celebration of our perfection. All right. So Peter says these beautiful words. He says, um, mold it in your memory. Verse 14. All the more since I know that my time in this tabernacle is almost done. And our Lord Jesus Christ has prepared me for this. Isn't it wonderful that death does not need to catch you by surprise? Neither does it need to interfere with your ministry. Paul is much more present today in his message than what he could ever be in his person. No wonder he wrote in Philippians 2.12, not only in my presence, you know. I mean, what could be better than his next epistle, than his promise for his next visit? Not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Discover every dimension, every detail of your salvation. <laughs> so Peter is in this, on the same run here. He says, um, in the meantime... Verse 15, one, Second Peter 1 Peter 1.15. In the meantime, I will do whatever it takes to make it possible for you to always be able to easily recall these realities even in my absence. Was Peter going to just um, go into Twitter mode from now <laughs> and archive some, some of his sayings, you know, get some 3D um, uh, uh, d DVDs, you know, megapixel DVDs established of his eyewitness account? Sometimes one wonders why God did not delay the coming of Christ in the flesh by 2,000 years. Imagine we could buy the rights, you know, or negotiate the rights. To do his miracles and somebody else get his on the parables and you know and then we've got the whole event recorded <laughs> there is not a moment of technology in its most advanced form 10 20 100 years from now that could ever match what god already has in you in your being in your more than 50 trillion human cells carrying three billion individual characters in every single dna strand It'll take you 96 years just to count the 3 billion characters at one per second in one of your single DNA strands. So um, in my absence, Peter says, I will make sure. Now this is 1500 years before the printing press. He says, I will make sure that you will be able at any time to recall these things. These things become such a beautiful theme in the context of Second Peter chapter 1. He says, we are not, verse 16, we are not con artists fabricating fictions and fables to add weight to our account of his majestic appearance. With our own eyes, we witness the powerful display of the illuminate presence of Jesus, the master of the Christ life. What is the kingdom of God all about? It is the dominion of the Christ life unveiled in unique you. I am so glad God did not go into Christ cloning mode. He loves the individual. You have no competition. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, while we compare ourselves by one another and compete with one another, we're without understanding. God has established an otherness in you. That is fully accommodated by his likeness. He so likes you. Because what he has in you will never be repeated in all eternity. You have no competition, so relax. 
So we are not con artists, Peter says, because you can imagine the rumor by now. It's about 30 years since he and, and James and John, the three fisher fishermen partners, had that encounter on the mountain. I mean, at least, shouldn't Jesus, Jesus have taken, you know, a few scholars from Jerusalem University to just document that moment when, when what Peter did, did, uh, acknowledged six days ago, isn't it interesting, six days later? Six days later? The son of man is the son of God. And upon this rock, I will build my, uh, this chip of the old block. I will build my ecclesia, my original ek out of uh, identity. I will unveil my original being. Not in a building in person, in a human life, in human relationship, in human interaction, in society. City set on a hill. <laughs> and the gates of Hades, Hades, not to see. The blindfold mode that kept multitudes of generations imprisoned, encamped in ideas and philosophies that they've passed on from generation to generation. But we have been redeemed, says Peter, by the, not by silver and gold, but by heaven's currency to awaken our mind of our original value and redeem us from the futile ways inherited from our fathers. In these last days, ha, don't go all fuzzy about last days. We're talking Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 and 3. Four to, how, where are we now? 2014, 2014 years ago. The last days were announced in the fullness of time when the hour has come. So what are we waiting for if the hour has already come? God, in these last days, has spoken to us. We're still his audience. You see, our ignorance, our indifference, not even our hostility or unbelief can successfully separate us from the one in whom we live and move and have our being. I so enjoyed Dr. Sarah's, Sarah McGee. Is it McGee? Yesterday. Oh, man. You cannot even blink or breathe, she says, without him. We are indeed his offspring. What a moment to be alive on planet Earth. As the express image, the ecclesia of God. Living stones connected like Lego blocks in the full stature of the eternal dwelling, the temple, the tabernacle, the address of the Most High. Finding voice, face, features, being in you. You are his address. Destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. The only reference to a third day resurrection in the Old Testament scriptures was Hosea 6 verse 2. And you know what that scripture includes us? It includes us. Hosea. What does his name mean? Salvation. 800 B.C. Declares after two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is God's declaration, his receipt. To our redeemed identity, innocence, value, everything that we've lost in Adam, redeemed forever. So, um, we are not con artists fabricating fictions and fables to add weight to our account. Of his majestic appearance. Isn't it wonderful that. We can encounter him. Beyond merely knowing him. From pages in a book. There is a majestic translation. When the music is heard again. In its original context. The word made flesh. And in that incarnate moment, the hidden treasure 
that was buried, hidden, in an agricultural field, was found, but buried again, until the transaction would be completed. No, no, not God buying mankind from the devil. A thief never becomes an owner. Don't ever make the devil part of your conversation or equation when it comes to salvation. He need not even feature in any prayer. I get so shocked and horrified, especially in Africa where we travel, you know, where sincere pastors would be busy encountering in their prayer life the Almighty. And then while they're talking to God, they say, And you, devil, who brings him into the conversation? Come on. Try and bind something that's been bound. Thoroughly defeated. It's like trying to call Pharaoh in. To come and help Israel to possess the nations. With our own eyes. We witnessed the powerful display of the illuminate presence of Jesus, the master of the Christ life. Verse 17. He was spectacularly endorsed by God the Father in the highest honor and glory. God's majestic voice announced. I've got no idea when we need to stop, brother. Is another 15 minutes? Five minutes. Oh, okay. God's majestic voice announced, This is the son of my delight. He completely pleases me. And what the father announces about the son is equally valid. Because Jesus did not come as an example for us, but of us. He has come to announce that Father is pleased with you. I mean, the angels did that, didn't they? They announced the pleasure of God over mankind. Glad tidings of great joy. Where would that great joy um, burst from? From our understanding that the days of deception are over. The days of walking around in a veiled form of unbelief, believing lies about ourselves, they are done with. They are over. God has come to introduce us to ourselves again in the life, death, burial and resurrection, ascension and co-seatedness of Jesus Christ. Nothing that the human race can do can get them more in than what they already are from the beginning. We are declaring in Christ where God has located us in Him who is true, says 1 John 5.20 and 14.20 John says, in that day you will know that I'm in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Now for just a final reference verse... 18 of Second Peter 1. For John, James, and I, the prophetic word is fulfilled beyond doubt. He says, here we are. We, we three guys, I mean, we were there. <laughs> we couldn't do any selfies at that moment. The technology wasn't quite there yet, but we were there. Something ignited in us. He says, it's beyond doubt. We heard this voice loud and clear from the heavenly realm while we were with Jesus on that sacred mountain moment on the mountain. You see, mountains don't become sacred. <laughs> Moments carries something that is so sacred. Beyond mountains. So don't try and put um, sacredness or unholiness on geographic places. You just walk there and carry presence. Light always dispels darkness. And there's not even a warfare about it. You don't first have to extract the drought. And then finally bring the water. No, just let the water do the drought. For as, okay, verse 19, for us the appearing of the Messiah is no longer a future promise, but a fulfilled reality. Is that an amazing mind shift for so many generations? You know, even John the Baptist, his cousin, was prepared to go back into the old mindset. Why? Because we're sitting in prison. 
And his own situation became his reality. And he thought, you know, but I, I should feel, I, I should be glorified. I mean, I've just announced, you know, Herod's sin. But he forgot that God announced the Lamb of God that takes away even Herod's sin, the sins of the world. And so he took offense and he began to doubt. Are you the one that is to come or shall we go back into waiting mode and wait for another? Peter says this. For us, the appearing of the Messiah is no longer a future promise, but a fulfilled reality. Now it is your turn to have more than a second-hand hearsay testimony. Take my word as one would take a lamp at night. Isn't this beautiful? Remember Peter said, I want to make sure that at any time, that means even in your darkest days, in your most critical moments, you will be able to recall these things. What happens when we recall truth? Truth ignites. Philemon verse 6. The koinonia of our faith. Our participation in what our faith announces is energeo, says the Greek. Energized. Ignites. When that switch is turned on. And suddenly our faith is quickened. How does it happen? Simply by our acknowledging every good thing that is in us. How do we know it's there? Because it's mirrored in Christ. In Christ, Philemon, verse 6. I'm almost through. Take my word as one. Take a lamp at night. The day is about to dawn. You know when we read words like that? We go back into, oh, the time is near. Let's read the verse and understand what Peter says. The day is about to dawn. On the hero- uh, Let me just read it. Where am I? In your own understanding. God desires so much more reference in you. Than you just gleaning someone else's understanding. Nothing wrong with doing that. Read. Study. Take it as a lamp. But don't make the lamp. Your tomorrow. And future reference. Because the lamp's only there. To introduce the individual to personal encounter. Look what Peter says. When the morning star appears, you no longer need the lamp. This will happen shortly on the horizon of your own hearts. Of your own hearts. Your innermost being. Remember the two men on the way to Emmaus? While listening to the stranger voicing Familiar scripture, but in brand new context. It's no longer a future promise. It is a moment that has come. And their reaction was, did not our hearts ignite within us while he spoke to us on the way? And they were not in a particularly happy mode. They felt so disappointed about their doctrine. They, were, they, they so hoped that Jesus would be the next governor. He would kick the Sanhedrin, you know, in the butt. And he would get rid of Caesar. And he would establish at least a Christian party. And here he comes to establish his kingdom in ordinary people. Our hearts are wired to ignite. You are wired to be overwhelmed. With God's thoughts concerning you. Hallelujah. I just want to read one little sentence and then we through. Okay, there we go. Mm, thank you, Jesus. I think it was on my Facebook page a few days ago, something I wrote about a year ago. It says this. Imagine God finding a word worthy to hold his ultimate thought, his final, eternal, most intimate message to mankind. He frames this thought not in an ancient language of men or angels, but in an earthen jar, Jesus, the incarnate word. The one who gives express image to the invisible God in human person. 
In him dying humanity's death, he brings closure to every lie that we believed about ourselves. And in God co-quickening us in his resurrection, he powerfully introduces us to the redeemed life of our design. Now, with every definition of veil removed, we may behold him as in a mirror and discover and celebrate our own completeness endorsed in him. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much, my brother.